let's hope that the technology works. So welcome everybody to this evening about community gardens. It's a really exciting theme. Although right now things are cold, everything is blanketed with lots of snow. But as we know, things are moving on and we need to get ready for the summer. And there's always a rhythm in, in nature and rhythm in our lives. So, um, so today we wanna to talk about community gardens in very many different aspects and we all can relate in some way to, to gardens because I think that's where food grows and we all have our thoughts about community. Yeah, just wanted to, before we begin, I wanted to acknowledge that even though we're on Zoom and virtually, I wanted to acknowledge that uh, the traditional territory of the Anishinaabek Nation uh, is all around us. It's the people of the three fires known as Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi Nations. I wanna give further thanks to the Chippewa Saugeen and the Chippewa Nawash, uh, now known as the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation. Uh, I do wanna acknowledge uh, all the injustices that have happened in the past, um, starting with settler culture in general, to the treaty processes. And of course now with uh, systemic injustices and, dis and discrimination uh, to our um, indigenous neighbors and friends. Um, and I wanna uh, encourage you all to reflect on, uh, on, on what that means and what, um, and what reconciliation means to you. So uh, I will as well. And again, I wanted to uh, just encourage you to uh, uh, have, a, have a really great time tonight and join me in learning tons uh, about this and more about uh, community gardens. I'm really looking forward to learning a lot. Okay, let's get started with, let's get started, how to start. So Kimberly Edwards is from Thornbury Community Gardens. She's a coordinator there. Kimberly has a master's degree in strategic leadership towards sustainability and applies that at the community level through community gardens and, and entrepreneurial projects. She has launched two community gardens and has been involved in several others. She will share with us now her experience on location, funding, community partners, format, and more. Welcome, Kimberly. Thank you very much. Uh, it's nice to be here. It's nice to see some familiar faces. I actually am just coming off maternity leave uh, and I was previously, before I went on maternity leave, I was working with the Grey Bruce Sustainability Network on a food security project. So um, it's nice to be back in the game. Uh, I will start my, I mean, I'm, I'm also here to learn. Uh, so I'm just gonna share my experience, but it by no means is, the experience, um, but I have been found been the founder of several community gardens in the community. So uh, I'll tell you first about the gardens that I've been involved with and kind of their their structure and their location. Uh, and then I might kind of touch on what we have found works the best. So the community gardens that I helped to create, I include the Thornbury Community Gardens, which is the one that I'm currently involved with still, the Collingwood Community Gardens, which is um, on probably about its 10th year of operations. And I was with that project for the first uh, seven or eight years. Um, we have started several school community gardens and uh, those are in the Collingwood area. So that's it. Um, oh, we, and we've started a couple, we've tr I've tried in the past to start a couple rural community gardens. So for example, on the back acres of, of a farm property, someone said, sure, grow whatever you like um, in a community format. So I'll tell you that format didn't really work. Uh, I found people having to drive from far away to kind of a more remote location where water wasn't easily accessible was a bit of a flop for us. That was in the early days of uh, when I ran a nonprofit called Free Spirit Gardens. Um, but the successful ones have been, for example, so Collingwood and the Thornbury ones I'll talk most about. Collingwood Community Gardens is on a piece of private land in the middle of town. It's right between the two high schools. So the location is amazing. Uh, it's very, uh, very user friendly, very accessible. So you can get public transit there, you can walk there or you can drive there. Um, a lot of the users do walk or bicycle because it's very, it's right in the middle of town. Most people can access it through active transportation. Um, it's generously shared by the property owner with the community gardeners. Um, the property is, it has 70 in-ground rental beds um, and the property owner also um, kind of homestead farms about half of that, half of the five acre property. So two and a half acres. He, just grows a whole bunch of stuff. He enters the, the, the 
Collingwood Fall Fair. What's that called again? The GM, GM something. <laughs> I'm losing it. Anyhow, you guys know what I'm talking about. Um, so, so that community garden is still up and running and, and for the most part, it's operated by the gardeners. Like I, I don't think that there's much of an administrative touch there anymore, um, aside from Free Spirit Garden still handles uh, registrations and, and onboarding gardeners. Um, but for the most part, it's very um, community based. So that's on a private piece of property. And then the Thornbury Community Gardens are located on town property. So it's a bit of a different, a different relationship. Um, the Thornbury Community Gardens, as is anybody, can you just give me a show of hands if you've seen them or you know what I'm talking about? Okay, okay, there's a couple in there, great. Uh, so they're on town property and they've been running, they're going into their third season now. The Thornbury Community Gardens have um, 23 rental plots at the moment and a perimeter garden that's all edible perennials and uh, pollinator friendly plants that's tended to by volunteers and three or four of those garden beds within the gardens uh, are tended to by volunteers, uh, in particular growing for the Beaver Valley Outreach's emergency food cubby. And also we try to send any excess over to the Meaford Outreach um, emergency food cubby as well, or also known as a food bank. Um, so both of those gardens I'm speaking of do have a rental plot format for the most part. Except for the Thornbury Community Gardens, we do try to have the, this, this it's like a, a strip of perimeter gardens around the box of the, around the whole perimeter of the, uh, the gardens. It's about a, a three foot wide bed that goes around and, that's, and within that we've planted all sorts of things like um, uh, all sorts of edible perennials, lots of herbaceous things, you know, sorrel and uh, butterfly bushes and um, really a, uh, a lot of herbs, some berry bushes, some asparagus. And those crops are there to be enjoyed by anybody, including non-gardeners. Um, we recently did put in a fence. So originally the gardens weren't fenced. We had a little bit of teenage evening vandalism. And so we put in a fence, but it's not a gated fence. It is an open unlocked fence at the moment and it is scalable. It's only four and a half feet or four feet high. Uh, I probably probably will put a lock. How am I doing for time? Someone's watching me on time. Yeah, we were, hopefully we can um, keep all the speakers uh, to about uh, five to 10 minutes. And yeah, for sure, okay. you've done four minutes. <laughs> okay, okay, great. So uh, the gardens that I've overseen for the most part have been rental plot structures, so that format. There is of course the format of just community gardens, which is, uh, which is way that, the, that's the way that language seems to be interpreted in the community. If you say community gardens, I think I find a lot of people assume that it's just a garden that is shared by everybody and harvested by everybody. Uh, so sometimes um, saying allotment plots is a useful term to distinguish between what format you're using. Um, I haven't had much experience with a garden that is, it is entirely harvestable for the, or entirely managed by the community. I have had experience with school community gardens and I'll be curious to hear about someone else is speaking on schools, school community gardens, am I right? Is that you, Lee? Okay, I'll leave that to you. I haven't had good experience with three different schools and I find it's really difficult to keep things alive in the summer when no one's there. Even if parent volunteers sign up for two weeks, someone's bound to kind of drop the ball and then the next gardeners roll in and there's weeds everywhere and it hasn't been watered. So, and the watering system's a bit tricky because the custodial staff usually have a key. So I find school gardens a little bit tricky to be honest. And the beauty of a garden that's close to a school, we have, in Collingwood and in Thornbury we have this, is the schools walk to the, the community gardens and have a lot of workshops there. And so we've had great success with school workshops. Um, they even usually have time to plant and harvest something in the spring and plant and harvest something in the fall, you know, radishes, greens, that kind of thing. Um, the other thing I have to touch on is community partners. Uh, I think probably everyone here knows that uh, the more community partners you've got on board, the better. And we really like to collaborate on all of these projects. So um, like I said, the schools are usually involved, the town is involved. I, uh, we, we had Beaver Valley Outreach take on the community gardens. Originally it was an independent project and then we kind of had uh, Valley Outreach if they would uh, assume the project under their, their umbrella, uh, which is great. And then funding, I don't know if I need to touch too much on funding beyond hunt for grants if you're trying to start a community garden. Having it operated under grid super advantageous for finding funding if you're trying to 
uh, fund a new project. We currently are funding or, or we're fundraising for an expansion of the Thornbury Community Gardens of 10 raised beds. Um, we got some really great ideas from the Wyerton Community Gardens. They had they have accessible raised beds that have this shape to them so that anybody with a mobility device can access the garden because they can park their mobility device underneath this ledge. Um, so we're going to design a couple of those because we have a we have a high seniors population here. How do you prevent volunteer burnout and keep the gardens going? You know what I've I find we started really small on volunteer input and volunteer demand at the Thornbury Community Gardens, and I think that really worked. We didn't start with any food bank plots at the beginning. We don't have a oh, this is a, this is a topic for later, but we don't have. I didn't at the Thornbury Community Gardens. We don't have a on-site compost system, and the community, the Coll the Collingwood Community Gardens. I found the on-site compost system was very volunteer heavy uh, and li literally heavy to turn and all that kind of labor. So, I um, we have the, an organic. We have the town organics truck come and pick up the, our organics and bring it to the landfill. Um, so I think that the key is maybe to start with a model that really isn't counting on too much volunteer input and see what you get in terms of volunteer uh, commitment. We are really lucky that we have two volunteers of the Thornbury Community Gardens who, who really take on a lot and they, they, they use it as their own baby, really, their own home project um, and are really committed to community service. So I don't, I, I think I'm just lucky and come back to me in five years if I lose that volunteer and maybe I'll have a better strategy for, for preventing volunteer burnout. How do you keep people from stealing your vegetables? So that's what I was speaking earlier to. We did put a fence up. We had a couple encounters where since we didn't have a fence, um, community, people from people parking to go play hockey at the arena in particular, we found were coming into the gardens and not quite understanding that they were um, personal plots and there was some some you know harvesting of vegetables um, that didn't that didn't that weren't grown by them because I think there was a mis misunderstanding of what community garden means with the sign as well it says Thornbury community garden so then we put up some more signage so signage was key a little bit of a fence like just to just to give that physical barrier a fence gates we can add a little padlock to our gate to prevent theft um, and then within the gardeners there is a, a strong level of respect about who's growing what and and then at the same time, as most gardeners know, there's always loss and whether it be to squirrels or to bugs or to other humans who really wanted a cherry tomato. This is kind of part of the circle of garden life. Uh, you welcome asks uh, oh, what's your experience with acceptance of the community gardens by the community and by the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, Luckily, the Thornbury Community Gardens has had good, uh, good acceptance. There has been some concern, especially when we had uh, a little bit of vandalism on site, the vandalism kind of spread to the neighboring backyards. Um, so I think that community relations are really important. In the Collingwood Community Gardens, for example, we had um, to access them via car, you have to go down quite a quiet cul-de-sac street, and you're at the dead end is where the access to the community gardens is. So we had to have a lot of uh, really good conversations with the residents um, and 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 conversations with the gardeners about driving extremely slow, being respectful. We really tried to have people use active transportation to get to the gardens or to park at the school and then walk from there, um, so that uh, so the residents weren't concerned about to increased traffic on their road. And for the most part, everyone's pretty understanding about that. The gardeners, in particular, understand that they're you know it's a it's a, it's a you're pretty lucky to be able to use someone else's property to grow some food on. So uh, they were pretty respectful of that. Now, a small piece on that, and I'm sure someone else will touch on that. I find the compost from your dump is mostly yard waste uh, broken down. So I don't find it's very rich in nitrogen. I don't find it very, very nourishing for the garden. I always encourage people to use some manure alongside with that or something or worm castings or home compost uh, in their gardens. Thanks. Uh, I'm one. Uh, James is curious about the benefits uh, of community gardens, and mm -hmm. uh, and another question: if you could ask if if your position uh, with the Thornbury Community Gardens is a modestly paid position or no? Oh, who knows? Really, I just you know you just get into something and then you, you're you're in it. I, I started this project and I have to see it through to some degree. And yes, so now I've I've worked a stipend into my into my work there. It's still kind of a uh, it's not a stipend. It is an end of year. I get a, a small salary at the end of the year 
And then actually for my, for the expansion of Thornbury Community Gardens, I did work in a project management fee that I have to fundraise for. So if I secure these grants, then the administration fee I can get paid out of. So it's, you know, it's, it's kind of like an entrepreneurial gig. Um, if you can get the money, you can pay yourself the money. And the gardener's, uh, the gardener's rental fees is what pays for my, just my, my annual salary of coordinating the gardens. Um, and I think I just, I'm just really passionate about homegrown food and, and growing good food and saving seeds. And uh, actually it is kind of a revolution. It is, maybe it is going to save the world. <laughs> that's, really. that's outstanding that there's, um, a, a, that it's budgeted for some labor. So that's, that's great. One very last question is, uh, are rules established around chemical and pesticide use? Yes, in all the community gardens that I've run in the agreement, we have we have an agreement that has a whole bunch of kind of um, conditions that everyone has to agree to. And we've always said organic practices. Um, and we've also often said not no invasives, no aggressive plants like mint that are just gonna, if you, because if someone leaves their garden and they cut the mint in half by accident, the next gardener is stuck with mint. <laughs> Teresa, you're, you're <laughs> I'm cracking up over there. Yeah, no mint. There's no mint in Thornbury Gardens. You have to pot it and sink your pot. Um, so nice. yes, there are rules and there are no non-organic uh, pesticides or herbicides permitted. Um, and, and then we, we educate, we do educational workshops around that, right? Then you provide educational workshops on how to do it without using the chemical pesticides and herbicides. Um, so I am the Healthy Living Coordinator um, at Kick and Dosogamic Elementary School. And, um, and so I, I made just a little presentation. I'm visual, I'm a teacher, so I have pictures, so you can kind of see what's happening. And I'll just keep talking while um, I'm getting an update because I just really want to paint that picture of how we got started uh, gardening at the school and just how it's branched out into the, the community um, on a larger level, especially during COVID from Nia Shingming. So like Lee said, this is our program. It's Minobimazuin. And what that means is the good life. That's what that translates as. And it really focuses, we understand that we're not just physical beings. That, um, so our approach uh, that started at the school, the Healthy Living Program started at the school initially with a nutrition program. And then uh, we, we branched out to that the school is the hub. We are the primary hub of engagement. And I always say, you know what, change isn't going to happen from the higher ups down. And so I am really blessed to be a teacher, um, an educator, because you know our children, they're seeds and they're just powerhouses. So that's where I have the privilege of working is with the youth of Neoshingaming. And uh, we've seen them grow up. So I've been healthy living coordinator there for uh, seven years um, as a part-time coordinator. And um, we started gardening there uh, just over five years ago. So um, I had to go back to my old computer <laughs> and kind of look through. So um, simple beginnings in 2015. Like I said, we were, we were a nutrition program uh, initially. Uh, it, it was basically that we were trying to meet the immediate need of child hunger. We had kids coming to school hungry. And so that was the, uh, the basis of the program initially. As that became, we have a substantial um, food program, nutrition program in the school. Then we, we started um, just visioning what, what our school could be, what school grounds could be used for. So in 2015, we, we started with four large garden boxes here, uh, which the uh, Trade Start program at the Salvation Army in Wyarton made for us and um and our our gardens they're not made to sustain our nutrition program at this time they are really uh for education purposes for teaching that the kids can get their hands dirty that um and it's just every year is a is a step-by-step -step process so this was our first year the pictures that i'm showing you and uh what we noticed is that there there was a lot of gardens um at the school that just they had good ground usable ground that we could use and there was just ornamental plants in there so we really just wanted to be gardening and um and like i said the kids are completely on board so you know these are pictures here of them starting the plants in 2015 
and um, we just kind of use the, a grid system so we're really incorporating math and like we really used it um, like cross curriculum like we try to meet uh, you know curriculum but they're outside outside learning and uh, so these are just some pictures uh, we, we always try to um, to incorporate the Anishinaabe MON into our, our teachings so you know the the kids were making up little signs there I don't know if you can see it Miss Godisman green beans so and they made them they made the 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 little signs for the plants and so they were just right from the get-go they were just super keen um that's our first harvest not the best looking zucchinis but you know what they were they're all right <laughs> the kids were super excited um and just to kind of touch on what Kimberly was saying that was an issue with school gardens is there's no kids there in the summertime so how do you upkeep a garden during uh, school during the summer so uh, we were just really lucky um, that we have kids just where the school's located right across the road and they actually committed to coming over and we have staff there all year round we're not like other schools. We're just really a small community school. We're like family. Um, the the staff that work over the summer, they were on board. They were out there weeding, um, you know, hooking up the hoses for the kids, and they were just fabulous. And and one of the things that the volunteers that came over, um, they could harvest the food that that they were taking care of. Whatever they wanted, they could take. And it, and it just, especially the kids, they just were really proud to like take home a basket of beans or some lettuce or snap peas or whatever um, home, right, and eat them. So we really found this first year that a lot of kids didn't understand where food comes from. They didn't understand really that, you know, I plant this seed and I'm, I'm going to get a cucumber out of it. There was really no connect with where food comes from. So that's what we were facing in 2015. Um, but we just started, we started small. Um, the picture that's up there is on edible landscapes. I'm not a gardener. I, I, I really am not, but I just, I just see potential. And I just knew if we got the kids excited about it, we could just run with it. And so, you know, one thing that I did with them is they, they had to look through storybooks and find different foods. And if they could give me a list, a wish list, I would try to find those, those plants for them. Right. So they were, you know, reading the hungry caterpillar and, you know, like, oh, can we have a pear tree or can't, you know, sure, sure you can, you know, so we just, this first year was just learning together, growing together. And uh, so 2015, it just really took root. Uh, but the edible landscape uh, that you see here in 2015, that really um, kind of pushed, pushed me towards, um, how we can transform school landscapes into an, an, a, a completely beneficial one. Like I said at the beginning at that time, there was a lot of um, just ornamental, ornamental plants. And, you know, to me, it just wasn't okay. It just wasn't okay. I, I said, we have all this, all these gardens, let's have it be completely 100% beneficial. So that's how the vision started in 2018. And so really it, it was whether the plant was edible, good for food, good for medicine, good for traditional uses. And, and that's how, how it determined what, what we planted at the school. And so uh, the first task was getting the kids to tear out all the, all the ornamentals. And I remember one of the girls said, this is so hard, like, because what was planted just had roots all throughout these gardens, and it was horrid, like, they were just, it wasn't attractive at all, right, I think it was just, you know, whoever did the landscaping, oh, like, this will survive for a while, it'll look okay, but it was not beneficial, and I remember when that girl said that, and um, she said, like, wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it have been easier if we just planted these things in the first place, I said, yeah, if we had been asked, I would have said, let's plant berry bushes in here. Let's plant something beneficial. And I said, so let this be a lesson. I said, like, that, you know, do it right the first time. Then you don't have to tear it out and do it again. But we had the seven eights. We put them to work and they really loved it. So um, these are just some examples. 
I know you said about mint, but we do have mint. <laughs> we have mint. We have we have wild mint in in our areas, right? And we use it. We use it in teas. So we have one area where we have our mint, and uh, we love it. We have our seniors come over. We can pick fresh mint from the gardens, put it in tea. We dry it. So, um, but yes, I totally understand how it just spreads like <laughs> crazy. But it's so fragrant, and the kids the kids love it too. So, uh, there's me. So, just you know, strawberry plants taking taking root. I think Amy's on tonight, I believe. So there's Caleb there in the middle. I think he submitted my name to Lee. So <laughs> I made sure I put a picture of Caleb in there. But um, we were really blessed to have uh, Caleb's experience and knowledge just kind of impact us in 2019. And so the vision of making it a completely uh, edible landscape it, it happened in 2019 and I, I thought it would have taken years, but just with, um, with Caleb and, and Amy supporting this project, just and, and working with our local species at risk, uh, our, our Nawash species at risk um, experts, what was traditional, what was native here? Because when the school was built, so much was dug out and thrown away. And we really wanted things that were native to Nawash and Ming and, if, and um, and just benefit you know, that would benefit our, our our students and our families. So that picture there, Caleb showing them how to put a big thick layer of mulch down and that sweet grass growing. And I can't tell you how many comments we've had from our families when they come in, just the smell of sweet grass. And it's just there's just something very um, therapeutic about it. It's it reminds you of your grandparents. And so just this was the front walkway as soon as you come in that's what you're smelling um these are some of the apple trees that we planted with our little our little gardeners um this picture here is an example so this is the front walkway when you come in like on the on the left that's what it looked like and um and then with the volunteers and with with guidance and support uh by caleb uh, on the right you see the the product and so it was just a really fun day. It was hard work, but you know what? To me, this is what community does. And we just kind of put out the call and our, our community family well-being um, just brought volunteers and it was so much fun. We laughed and, and we got all these plants in. Um, that's just an example. So on the top left, you see like the plants that we put in, uh, that sweet grass and in the middle, you can just see how established it's become. On the right, that's sweet grass that I've actually harvested and dried. So it's we're it's already like from 2019, like I'm harvesting. I was harvesting last year. So there's just something just really wonderful about that, that that's taking place right on our school grounds. We have a pollinator garden, like um, specifically like that we have a pollinator garden and we just, because you know what, um, even milkweed, like people don't even, no, but we use that for like poison ivy. <laughs> so it's it's medicinal, but also we're encouraging our, our friends to come, right? Because they are the ones that help us, they're our helpers. So we have nice little uh, pollinators there. Um, and then we're just letting it become established. What I what I love about the the native plants that we we put into our gardens is that they're so resilient. They are absolutely resilient. And you know, Kimberly was talking about watering. And like we have issues with that, um, but with these plants, we, we lost nothing. All the plants that the traditional native plants that we put in the ground survived. And I think that's just, I mean, very telling, <laughs> you know, and it's, it's just, I think a, a really good lesson to take. Uh, there's my son benefiting from the strawberries that are growing at the school. We had many families during the pandemic um, come to the school our, our mindset is this is for everybody, right? So we have families come, they play on the playgrounds after hours during, um, during the summer. And I would come and you'd have families picking, picking the berries. And you know what, it was just beautiful to see. So, um, which kind of leads us to last year. And, and that was the pandemic. And I don't know if anybody else has noticed this, but there was just such a burst of interest in gardening. And so that's what our focus was on last year. 
because we weren't in school, we weren't at the gardens. And so we said, how can we kind of support gardening our families um, in the Ashingaming? So there were there are difficulties in our area. There are different land types. Like me personally, I'm on clay and rock. And um, another problem is space. Like you, you might have space, but that's where your septic bed is. So you can't be digging into it and planting gardens. Um, other difficulties, maybe just lack of resources and lack of knowledge. Like I said, you know what, I'm not a gardener. So, but I know who to pick on. Like I can kind of just, you know, hey, what do we do here? And so last year we just said, let's just do it. Let's just start small. What can we do? And so we partnered. There was a, a bunch of programs here within NAWASH that partnered together and um, we provided gardening supplies for over 135 households. And there's over 150 that were gardening. So out of 280 households in Nawash, you had over 150 households gardening in some way. And so, but what we did, our program is, you can see the, the bags there, the planter bags, because I said space is huge. And uh, these were ideal for any household, even our seniors that live in the Madoki Center, they just have balconies. These planting planter bags worked fabulously. And so they were able to plant um, like lettuce in them, tomatoes. Um, these are actually uh, plants that we received from friends of ours just up on Covenese Hill there. Um, I don't know if anybody knows Peter Alaming. They gave us these tomato plants and we're like, yeah, we'll pot them and we'll give them to seniors. And so that's what we did. And so every, whoever was interested could, um, you know, get the bags. We had three gallon, five gallon, 10 gallon, 15 gallon bags. So some seniors use them for herbs and they're really versatile because they have um, handles. So they are really easy to move. Uh, we grew our tomatoes in them. So there's my niece on the, on the left there repotting the tomato plants. My son's there with our tomatoes and that's growing in one of the fabric bags. And this is my garden. Like I said, I have nothing no usable ground where I am. So it was raised garden beds, it was container gardening. And that's what I found a lot of people were doing. They were really interested in container gardening. And we had so much positive feedback just from the, the garden supply giveaway and people were excited for this year. So that's really what we're looking forward to. I just said, you know what, start small. Just try to grow some lettuce, maybe some peas, whatever, get your kids involved. And, you know, we were growing out of like, you know, those home hardware pots, whatever you can grow out of. We, uh, one thing we did do is we had a big diff, uh, a big delivery of soil um, available at the Madoki Senior Center. So we had triple, triple blend brought in. We had um, whatever that they might need. We just had it there. So people could come and access that. And if they needed it for their home gardens, we, we didn't want them to have to worry about resources. We just said, you know what, just start, start somewhere. And it was just, it was a huge success. Um, some of the cucumbers, what, something else that we did was how to preserve it. So we, we did canning classes, which we will continue this year as well. Um, just getting people to think about, you know, how can you grow something and then um, yeah, preserve it. So our plans for the future are to continue our school gardens and expansion. We want to expand our orchard with more fruit trees. Um, we really, from feedback from all the families, uh, they wanna grow their gardens this year. So we really wanna support them with that. And also support uh, gardeners from start to finish. Like last year it was kind of, we were behind the, behind the game. So here we just like wanna start them. Like, when do you start? When do you start your, your seeds now, right to fall? Like even seed saving. So we've already had people come on board. Like, I'd love to be able to show you how to save seeds. And so we're really excited for that. Um, providing education and sharing sessions for gardeners, which is what really like, I, I really wanna see what happens here because I think this is a great network that maybe we could just open up op opportunities if people had questions about their gardens that I think there's a, a wealth of knowledge here within this forum. And um, yeah, so that's what's happening. <laughs> and my son won the, the squash growing contest. <laughs> That's his uh, butternut squash, <laughs> or so spaghetti squash, sorry. <laughs> so we're looking forward to this growing season.
Fantastic. That's thank, it. Thank Sorry. you, D. That was <laughs> that was so inspirational and some and some tips peppered in there too. We don't have time for a lot of questions. Uh, Thanks, Amy, to come to this uh, session today. It's all yours. Thank you for having me. Um, I am just really pleased to have a few minutes to share with everyone a little bit about what I'm doing. Can you see and hear me okay before I share my screen? Okay, I got some nods. So um, I'm going to share a little bit about um, my role as Community Food Program Facilitator with the Bruce Peninsula Association for Community Living, which is BPACL, uh, facilitating a community food program. So this is part of the, the why of community gardening, which is food and specifically food security. This might be old information for some people, but I think it's worth mentioning what food security is. Um, and I like, to, I like to describe it by the five A's. A, uh, available so that sufficient food, enough food is available for all people at all times. That food is accessible. So mm, physically and economically, people can access the food. That food is adequate. So it's nutritious and it's safe and that it's produced in environmentally sustainable ways. That a person's food is acceptable, so it's culturally appropriate, culturally acceptable, and that it is produced and obtained in ways that do not compromise a person's dignity, their self-respect or human rights. And the agency behind food are the policies and processes uh, in part in the achievement of of food security. So for the people supported by BPACL, um, I started in a role to address their food insecurity. And I have been approaching that in a number of different ways. Um, but one important component is growing food. Uh, we started at the in July last year, uh, planting whatever we could get wherever we could find space for it. This was the largest space that we had behind one of our residential buildings um, that once it was cleaned up with weeds, we just shoved it with every plant we could get our hands on at that time of the year. And in some locations, oh yeah, so we just, some of them were volunteer plants, tomatoes that came up and other things, just whatever we could manage to get. At other residential locations, this is where we're growing at um, BPACL's residential uh, sites. We just literally tore up the grass and flipped it over and plunked in whatever we could. So in the front of a couple of residential buildings, we also made use of some of the open space. And thanks to some fundraising, we were able to afford putting in some raised beds. So about of the six that we got put in, we purchased three from a local woodworking work, woodworker and in the bottom right are the one of the three that we also built, which was a little bit of a challenge because not all the wood that I was looking for was available. So it meant kind of uh, improvising a little bit on the design. And uh, there's with the consent of a few of our participants, their smiling faces are in here. So they do know that they're gonna be shown today. And I think a couple are even on the call. Um, this is some of the, the goodies that we were able to produce this year. So the way that we're growing is not a community garden by the same definition that most will understand it, in that it's not uh, for the wider community, but it is for our, uh, our smaller community of BPACL. And we are growing right on the, the homes, the front yards and the backyards of the people supported. But the hope is that, you know, I, uh, we're not shying away from being visible. We're putting the gardens right out in front. And um, a big part of, of what we do is being integrated in the community. And I want people to see us and for us to be seen and to, see, to show that we're growing and um, people are engaging in their, their own food production. And then of course, 
there's a whole host of other activities that have already been mentioned that go along with not just growing food, but saving seeds, um, the fun of harvesting. Uh, and a little shout out to Simona who provided us, she shared the garlic with us so that we were able to plant garlic. There are some other, oh, and of course the food, right? So we, um, we don't just uh, harvest and do nothing with it. The, the harvested food goes right inside the residential homes and um, there's Diane smiling with her tongues and uh, cooking the food that we harvested. I also make use of our, our harvests in a weekly Zoom cooking program. There is uh, another pilot project that uh, I'm hoping to start in the spring, which is a collaboration with the Bruce Peninsula Community Food Bank and the Community Gardens at the Wives and Salvation Army, so that families supported by BPACL will get to grow and give and receive food in a collaborative way. And this is aligned with the food bank's goal of becoming more of a food hub. So coming back to the food security part, um, growing a garden and growing your own food does not make any one person or group of people food secure. And no one thing will make people food secure. It's part of the bigger picture. Um, and in addition to giving us the goodness of healthy food, it also brings that connection to nature, uh, an understanding and appreciation of the value of food, the social interaction, inspiration and learning and sharing. Natasha Akiwenzi and Victoria Serda are members of the Bagarawad Alliance. They have a community garden, pardon me, a community greenhouse project. Uh, again, not uh, your conventional community garden. It's yet to be announced, but they're in the process of applying. They haven't received their funding yet, but after it's confirmed, hopefully it'll bring together experienced people and staff to work the greenhouse uh, for their community. So Natasha and Victoria, go ahead and, uh, and let us know about this project. Okay, uh, so Bagadawad is a not-for-profit environmental group that's led by fishery, fishing families from uh, Neashinimink, actually from the San Territory. Uh, this was a dream of my husband's for uh, before we had children and before we had a house. His dream was to live in a greenhouse before we actually had a house um, and to have a bunch of chickens running around outside and uh, and what have you. So this was a dream about 28 years ago when we first met, maybe possibly longer than that, and uh, was to get a greenhouse. Um, he always had a green thumb, always had a green thumb. He was excellent with plants. He would talk to um, talk about the soils to me back then. We don't have any soil where we are, very much like Dee. We're on clay, we're on uh, cobblestone. Um, we have a lot of stone. Uh, we found all over the years there's not much that grows in the stone. And we also have bedrock about three feet down. So we can't exactly dig too far before we hit water or we hit uh, bedrock. And then we have an alva in our backfield. So it's not, uh, it's not exactly a place to do a lot of growing. Um, but we did um, have this dream and what we did start doing about a year and a half ago, we started talking about uh, applying to a grant to do a greenhouse. A large grant, it was 32 by 100 feet. It was going to have a wood boiler system in it and to have electricity by solar panels to it. So it's not gonna to have to run off one of our buildings. Uh, my husband, he would be the one that would be working it because he is excellent with plants and soils and he can talk about all the little critters that live in it and find it happy and how to make soils happy and he can talk for hours about it. Uh, he's a fisherman but he does like the soil too. Um, myself uh, it's best that I just enjoy the profits of the greenhouse. You know I enjoy salads. I'm a vegetarian. You know I would love a fresh salad every uh, couple of nights. You know a to toasted tomato sandwich is wonderful um, but I yeah my spot is not in the greenhouse. So with that agreement and made, I will 
take care of the animals. The plan was I would take care of the animals. I would help them produce enough poop. I would fertilize the greenhouse <laughs> in the gardens on the outside. So we talked about it a lot and we finally got it pretty much on the way. But uh, this is where Victoria comes in because she has to take it over from this point on where we get all the little beautiful little plants up and going and uh, and then just keep me out of there and keep my goats out of there and uh, we can call it a happy day. <laughs> <laughs> the goats are dangerous. Uh, so are the chickens though. Your chickens also could take over the garden pretty quickly. Yes. <laughs> Um, and, and just so you know, like we're, we're working towards this, but we're not sure when we're going to be able to get a greenhouse because as many of you know, when you're doing funding applications, it can take a while to do. Um, and also, I, like I used to be an organic farmer and I've actually helped start um, the, the greenhouse with Bagatawad would be my eighth community initiative that I started around food in community spaces. So uh, it's something that I keep working on in, in different uh, places and environments over the years and it's probably my favorite because I think that um, we're all very connected to food and we're very connected to being outside when we can understand our food and that's how we pay attention to all that is around us and I think that's really important for everybody so um, I would also kind of just want to say like I appreciate that everyone here is helping people to get outside and be connected with nature because that is one of the most important things anyone can do in order to deal with climate change and you know being a good human being on the world that we're in and in the land that we're in um, but i i have a huge amount of experience with other community gardens and other uh, community initiatives um, one thing i just wanted to mention before I know we're running a little over time, but uh, one, of th one of the things we planted at Fairy Lake in Southampton was uh, oyster mushrooms. And I hadn't heard anyone else talk about mushrooms tonight. And I just wanted to plant that idea for people because uh, mushrooms are a really great thing to put into public spaces, um, in part because they're really good at cleaning the water, but they are, are very good food um, and very nutritious for people. So just a, a small plug for mushrooms. And so we'd love to be able to keep the conversation with other people. And if people have uh, ways that they could use a community greenhouse, or if there are things that we could grow um, for other places, let us know because we can um, add that into our grant applications as partnerships. Um, but we're also talking about CSAs um, because we used to do a CSF, which was a community supported fisheries. Um, so we're looking at like doing a CSA and then also you know, possibly setting up like a vegetable stand uh, to make it accessible to people. Um, so just uh, making the food accessible, using the greenhouse as a teaching tool, um, seeing it as a social way of connecting with people. Um, it's hard to be in a bad mood when you're in a greenhouse playing with soil and watching things grow. And uh, But we are really looking forward to a greenhouse just because of climate change. Um, I'm sure that's happened to many gardeners here where these uh, sudden downpours have uh, taken all your, your plants and have washed them into one tiny little corner of your garden or has taken all your topsoil and deposited it somewhere else. Um, <laughs> that's the nice thing about raised beds and being on cobblestone. Um, so that's one thing with the greenhouse why we're looking forward to uh, to uh, a greenhouse that we can monitor those sort of uh, uh, atmospheric, uh, whatever, climate abnormal activity that's happening right now. Do you plant sweet grass and what are the benefits of planting sweet grass and what are the uses? I heard it's really good for your hair. <laughs> it's also good as a medicine, uh, as a traditional medicine for us, but uh, I make uh, soap and shampoo and uh, with the street grass oil. Um, I know we hope to use it in our uh, shampoo. How do you bring the community in? It's hard okay. right now because of the <laughs> pandemic. <laughs> I just gotta say, because Nashingaming is a closed community right now. So I can't even go there. <laughs> um, but it, it's, uh, 
there, there are lots of ways that people can support us. So if you just want to send us an email or follow us on Facebook, Natasha's really um, good at keeping people in, in touch with what's going on. Um, but uh, we'll have to see when the pandemic opens up. We'll probably, um, once we get going, we'll, we'll start opening up community workshops again. Um, we're also doing online discussions around, uh, we've done quite a few around food sustainability and uh, had really good discussions uh, around how we can do that for the whole region, so. Yeah, thanks again, Natasha and Victoria. I really like your optimism with all these obstacles. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce Teresa Pearson. She's the program manager, social recreation and leisure at Canadian Mental Health Association, Grey Bruce. I'm sure many of you have heard of Audrey Hepburn's amazing quote, but I love it. To plant a garden is to believe in tomorrow. And to me, it speaks to so much of why I do what I do. And I think it is about hope. Um, and I really believe in it. I see it in the people from all walks of life that come and garden with us, that come and get their hands dirty. And, um, you know, when I think of why, why has gardening been so popular during this pandemic? Part of it, I think, is people wanting to grow their own produce. But I also think Part of it is people wanting to have some hope, wanting to have a tangible way to, to, to have a sense of hope. And when I started working at CMHA um, 11 years ago and working on gardens, I was so sure that someone was going to ask me why CMHA was involved in gardening. And because we do, of course, addictions and we do mental health and we have all these different. And I started at that time collecting um, a lot of articles on the mental health benefits. Of, I wanted to be ready because I just thought I need, and I have a huge binder. And to this day, no one has ever asked me. I just expected a community member at some point to say, why are you involved in, like I'm ready. And so I've come to the con conclusion that either everyone knows or I don't know, but I'm just surprised to this day that no one has, has asked me. So you know, maybe one of you will come into the office tomorrow and demand to see that binder. I don't know, but. I'm ready in case you're wondering. Um, so what we have alone in Owen Sound, just to give an idea, is um, we have over um, by um, the Fresh Roots Gardens area, we have uh, 42. Um, and so they're um, 10th coming down 10th Street and 4th. It's over by St. George's um, and it's called the Fresh Roots Gardens. Uh, we have 42 community garden beds there. They're four by eight beds and they have seating for people. Um, and then we have 54 beds that we employ people uh, with mental health experience. Um, and they came up with that term. Um, when I would um, um, speak to people, um, didn't like using mental illness, mental health issues, mental, and was chatting with the folks and was like, guys, help me come up with something. And so in our conversation, they came up with, well, what about mental health experience? You can use that on a resume. And so that's the term that I now think mental health experience we all have mental health experience as far as I'm concerned, but so I employ people with mental health experience and that is uh, for a lot of them, they either have never worked, haven't worked in a long time. And I like to say I have the privilege of reminding them about their awesomeness. Um, it's a fabulous place to start um, to work. Um, you're out in the um, fresh air um and you have a job that matters um it's not a pretend job there is nothing in that job that is created that is false 
um, you need to come to work. Your plants will not water themselves. And you are from the beginning, um, you have say, you have input in what is grown. Um, you are nurturing your plants, you are caring for them. Um, you are um, tending them as they grow, you harvest, uh, you help prep, and then you get to watch the food that you bring in being served to your community. Uh, we have a brunch program that runs from Monday to Friday, and you get to see that food being served to your community. Um, also, our food um, is used, we have a catering program, and um, so that food is also used in our catering program. And we are working on um, having a cafe open before I collect my pension. And I know it's going to happen. Um, and uh, probably this year, um, but I've said that last year too, but I feel really good about 2021. Um, but um, so there's lots of opportunities. A lot of people have started in the garden program and then uh, started working at the back of the kitchen, gone to the front of the house and come all the way to working in black and whites and catering. So it's just been an incredible opportunity of growth. And we've had people who have been 45 years old, three generations of never working and are now employed and just bursting proud. I mean, in our community garden program, I mean, you can see the significant mental health benefits for gardeners. I mean, growing and tending to their plants, spending time with others in a supportive, caring environment, being outdoors, sorry, my dog's licking my toes, stop it, um, taking part in physical activity. Um, and again, they get to share, oh yeah, um, they get to share with others their produce. I mean, all of those things uh, are, are just phenomenal. We've had some beautiful examples of people um, looking out for each other and, and really um, from incredibly shy people um, and, and really everyone goes at their own pace and, and, um, and, and people are just, I think as you all know, gardeners are a beautiful group of people anyhow, um, but they're just so kind with each other, I find. And whether it's leaving a plant in someone else's box for them or oh, how'd you get your tomatoes so to, oh, could I give you a hand, you know? And even when language is a barrier, I remember coming in and we had um, uh, um, some Syrian refugees had created, and honestly, they grew their tomatoes eight feet tall. And they had these beautiful, I've never seen people grow with the, the stake system. And I came in two days later and all of a sudden, this woman had her peas being grown on this system. They couldn't speak like a, a word, but yet they had managed to communicate with each other that they needed help and support and had worked together and created this system. I mean, it's just beautiful to see that kind of yeah, I just love it. I mean, anyhow, so I mean, it's those sorts of things, I think, that you see happening in a community garden system. And, and I just encourage everyone to, I mean, horticultural therapy is real. There is so many articles about it. Obviously, we have someone here that is, but there's so many articles to be found online about it. And, and I think it's so important that we look at it from that holistic um, approach and, and really, um, yeah, embrace it, embrace it on that level. Anyway, thank you very much for um, inviting me to join. I've been inspired already by everything I've heard tonight. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Bruce Botanical Food Gardens, we're located in Ripley, Ontario, which is in Huron-Kinloss Township. Um, we, this is, we are going into our ninth growing season and we're a little bit of a different model um, as our garden is, um, we're called a community garden, but we 
it, it, we plan the garden and then it is grown uh, by a group of volunteers and we do hire some summer students and in, a norm, in normal years, we've actually had a garden manager that we've been able to pay as a seasonal worker. Uh, we basically focus on heirloom, uh, rare and endangered plants and look at food sustainability and what grows well in our area, uh, do educational programs and tours and things like that that fund us so that we can actually be growing food um, for our community. We consider ourselves a living marketplace in that people, anyone can come and pick or harvest food that's grown in the garden um, throughout the growing season. And, um, but they can't, um, but we don't charge for it. We work on a donation system. Um, and also if people volunteer, they can also take the food. Now, we also uh, are in an area where we have a lot of marginalized community members. So we make sure that our donation box is put in a place where it is out of sight of anybody who happens to be in the garden at the time or working. So basically people give what they can and if they can't, they take what they need. Um, and that's been the model that's worked really well. But to get to the topic that I was sort of asked to speak about tonight, of course, the pandemic has changed things a bit for us because a lot of our funding was coming from tours and, uh, and workshops, which we, we couldn't do. So we developed a model, um, a lot of COVID protocol sheets. Um, we reached out to our volunteer base and beyond. We're on Facebook and Instagram, and we have a lot of community relationships. So with big brothers, big sisters, community living, the older Mennonite community in our area and uh, people who live in the area as well. So it's pretty diverse. And we set up uh, amongst a, a variety of different things, we used a program called Sign Up, which is the digital program and people could actually sign up for two hour stints to come to the garden. Um, this way we could monitor the number of people that we had in the garden at any given time. Um, through Bruce Power, they donated a bunch of um, disinfectants and masks to us so that we had access to that. We encouraged our, the volunteers that could to bring their own tools, but that wasn't always viable. And you can't have everybody bringing a wheelbarrow, let's be honest. Uh, so, you know, we, they, we had stuff there so people could disinfect. We're, um, we have currently planted about one and a half acres but and the garden is in four quadrants so and within those quadrants there's sections so it was easy for us to distance our volunteers and we could just kind of keep people safely apart but then how do we feed the community um, what we ended up doing was setting up a month uh, a weekly market where we actually, the volunteer group actually harvested what was available. We didn't know what would be available from week to week, um, you know, depending on the weather and how things were growing. Uh, so we were able to have a market. And again, the market worked on a donation basis. So people could come and take what they needed or what they were interested in. And that worked out pretty well. We also really started to focus on um, what we were giving to the food bank in Kincardine. And so every Thursday morning, I get uh, take what we had available and take it into the food bank. And that's something that we had always been wanting to do, but we were able to really focus on that a lot more. Um, and we're gonna to continue to use this model moving into this season because I think I don't think anything's going to dramatically change. Um, and we wanna make sure that people are safe um, while they're coming and working at the garden and also that people can get the healthy food. One thing that I was interested in, people were speaking about, um, we, we were talking, we were hearing about the greenhouses. We have a small greenhouse on site that we had sort of been using a little bit, but not really. And last, in this past year, we were able to get raised boxes um, made it for the greenhouse and were able to start tender greens and some of the, you know, radishes, things like that in, in the greenhouse and some plants for the garden. And so we were able to start to 
make food available to the community earlier than we have in the past, which has been great. Um, and when it got too hot, then we just moved all the boxes outside. Um, so they were actually outside uh, in the field beside the garden and, uh, and continued to plant them and grow them. Our whole garden um, is, uh, or is organic and everything is plant-based. We don't use any chemicals or pesticides at all. Um, we make our own comfrey tea. We have comfrey growing outside the garden. We make our own comfrey tea and use that as a fertilizer and an insecticide. Um, we make all of our own compost. We've been very lucky that the township is helpful to us because I remember Kimberly was saying about it's heavy work turning the compost. We have huge compost piles. So actually um, the township, when they're out and about, will come with their small loaders and actually flip it for us, which we've been very lucky in that way. The township gifted us actually five acres. Um, we're going, we're looking at moving into a food forest, a foraging forest, um, and we've started to plant that um, at, outside the perimeter of the um, main garden. Um, so it's just, it's interesting. It's being flexible seems to be the thing that we need to do the most. Um, we did have a plant sale to help us with money. Um, we actually made a cookbook this year as a, to do as a fundraiser as well, and calendars. Um, we also have, uh, we do our own seed saving and we use our own seeds as well, but we'll also be selling those. Our seed buckthorn is, just grows like crazy. So we're, um, and people are very, very interested in the seed buckthorn. So it has been a great source of, for us in terms of uh, money. People are very happy to do donate money to get access to the sea buckthorn. Um, but it's, we are, I see somebody's asking about seed donations. We do a lot of, we do do a lot of seed saving. We're always interested in donations. We just try to really stick to um, heirloom seeds. We don't um, and ones where we can just kind of track the genus of the of the plants that are in the garden. We have, if you're interested in in if you need forms for your volunteers or people who are working at the gardens, we've developed a pretty comprehensive set of um, forms for COVID protocols for contact tracing, and uh, and I'd be happy to share them with anybody who would want to. Where can we buy the cookbook? Um, you can check out our Facebook page or our Instagram page and just let us know. And I've got them here. So you can, you can get in touch with me too and I'll make sure that they get into your hands. Is your garden in a neighborhood? Uh, were there any difficulties with any neighbors uh, to buy in? Well, we, we do have one neighbor um, sort of to the west of us, but we're basically at the end of Park Street where, it, where we have the soccer fields on one side and then the gray water is pond is beyond us and the apple rail trail so we're kind of we are and then we have a field to the back of us and our other acreage so it's it's a small street but we're at the end we have had some problems with vandalism we're not uh closed but that was mostly because we because of the donation box and because we have um as i said ripley has got some issues of it has to do engaging the community and we knew where some of the problems were happening and actually we invited those people to come to the garden and help themselves to food and um by just and saying they could you know and saying we could use some volunteers and i think um it's kind of we found that by saying i see you and in a positive way it makes a huge difference in terms of people feeling marginalized or victimized. And, uh, and it's, it's helped us a great deal and it's helped build our community relationship too. I know uh, Ripley's in here, in, here on Kinloss, right? It has a, has a prog very progressive council. Um, one, from what I know, one of the only climate action plans in all of Gray Bruce. Um, so um, I heard you say that uh, they donated some land. Uh, has your team been working, uh, had anything to do with this sort of activism or this climate stuff that's happening with, with the municipality? We work, we work very closely with them. Um, and part of the reason that we're getting so much support for the forest is because, and actually the Lions Club is now going to be 
contributing to our foraging forest with a memorial forest for their members. And this is all part of planting more trees and part of the greening of Huron Kinloss and air quality. Um, so it's, and actually where the trees are going to go is between us and the gray water to help clean the water as it's moving you know, as it moves sort of towards, it's, uh, we've had a really good, healthy relationship with the Huron Kinloss uh, Council. It's all good. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's uh, wonderful to see you all. I uh, must say that I'm impressed what's happening in our um, counties. And I must say, I am, I can't wait to actually visit uh, some of your sites and come to see, um, the community gardens that you guys were talking about. Um, uh, what Lee is sharing right now is a composting 101, one of my workshops that I did uh, in Mifred Community Gardens. Um, the reason why I wanted to talk about composting, because it's not necessarily uh, a cup of tea for everyone, but I would like to ask you who, who here is actually composting. So raise your hands if you're doing your composting, good. That's awesome. Um, and the second question, how many of you are actually doing a functional composting? Does it really work for you? Do you have a good experience? Uh, maybe not so much. So I wanna uh, today just share with you why do I compost? And uh, I think that uh, composting 101 will be um, one of the uh, compulsory um, every year workshop that I would like to do in Meaford and I'm happy to share my workshop uh, at your community gardens if you uh, would like to. Uh, I can come and do the workshop for you. I think two years ago I've done one for Markdale and it was very successful. Um, so the reason why do I compost? I want to share with you um, when you compost you really need to uh, set your intention and make sure that you're doing it because you want to do it. Otherwise, you know, it can turn into uh, pretty nasty stuff. So one of the intention on the reason why I am composting is that um, I really like to build the uh, black gold. I can't really build any kind of gold, but black gold is definitely one thing that I like to do. The diversity in uh, organic matters it just blows my mind. I feel like whatever I put in my compost and it's organic uh, matter food from, from the food scraps to uh, coffee grinds to leaves and whatnot, as long as it comes from the nature, it can go to the compost. Uh, we don't use any fertilizers uh, or any chemicals. So I feel that I can put technically anything, but uh, I will tell you more about that. Um, I like to compost also because the compost is helping to retain the moisture and suppress uh, plant diseases and pests. I don't use, uh, as I said, any fertilizers. Uh, I don't normally put um, seeds uh, in our compost. I'm trying to avoid that. But I love how compost produces beneficial bacteria and fungi that breaks down the organic matter. And as I said, it's so forgiving. You can really put anything if you know what's the right ratio. So I would like to talk about three different composting today. Um, the reason why um, is because of the diversity again. So the regular composting, it's the aerobic composting, which is the normal compost that you have outside and you, you can start with the pile and just throw things in it. As uh, I mentioned in my handouts, three by three by three feet uh, big pile is just a good start. And in Mifred Community Gardens, what we created, we created a three compartments made out of pallets. And the key is to have the right ratio of carbon and nitrogen. Carbon are the brown items like hay, leaves, sawdust, wood ashes. The nitrogen are the green items like grass, veggie and fruit scraps, weeds without seeds ideally and uh, coffee grinds and whatnot. So who knows what is the right ratio? Does anybody wants to guess? So the recommended ratio is actually two to one. Two for greens and one for brown. What do you do when it smells? What, nobody likes the fall order and I, 
uh, must admit that I've seen um, and I smelled how bad compost can be. But what do you do? You you basically my my best uh, thumb of row is to make sure that if it's too wet, you gotta make it drier. You go with your intuition. If it's too dry, you probably need more uh, wet stuff like greens and stuff or just pour water and uh, just make sure that uh, it has a consistency. So when you press it, if you feel like you wanna touch it, uh, you press it and you get maybe one or two drops, but it's not too wet, it's not too dry. The second uh, composting that I like to do, and that's what I brought from out west is vermicomposting. So let me introduce you to our famous garden helpers, red wigglers. So without them, we would not be able to uh, do that. But red wigglers are special worms that turn our food scraps into warm poop called warm castings. These warm castings contain five more, uh, five more times nitrogen, seven times more phosphorus, and 11 times more potassium. That's why we love them so much. Um, so why wouldn't you do it? I love them so much that I felt that I need to share them with Mifred Komuti Gardens and with volunteers. We found an old bathtub and built a wooden platform and have the worms with us um, building our soil. Uh, and then the third one um, uh, is Bokashi. Bokashi is a newer style for me. Um, this is my kind of winter composting style. So it's not really community composting, but I don't know if you've heard of it. Bokashi is a Japanese word meaning fermented organic matter. And uh, this type of co composting is anaerobic. What that means is that you're trying to do it without the air. Um, through the fermentation, Bokashi composting generates garden family microbes, yeast and fungi. So I personally mix, the way how I do it, I personally mix sodas with molasses and the precious worm casting because you do need to add microbes as the effective microorganism. And the sodas and molasses, they serve as the food for the microorganisms. Um, and uh, what I do, I take two buckets, five gallon buckets. Uh, I stack them together in one of them, the top one, I screw, um, sorry, screw, I drill holes for drainage. And what I do, I just, over the winter, I just throw my food scraps into the bucket, layer it with my sawdust mix and uh, press it down with the rock and uh, close it and keep it in the garage if I have to. But I would never throw my food scraps uh, to the city. So stop giving your valuable food waste to the town's curbside green bin and let your garden benefit from it and take another step towards a more sustainable lifestyle. The, que the, question, the question that came up was any uh, tips on balcony composting? because a 60 liter container uh, didn't break down well. Well, uh, co balcony composting, I love it. Uh, well, I would say, why not? Uh, when I used to live in the city, uh, it was forbidden to compost on our backyard, but we did it anyway. As long as you turn it and keep the good ratio, you have nothing to worry about, just do it. Does it have to be more than a certain amount for it to heat up and break down? Well, the heat is one thing. Uh, you you do want to uh, heat it up and uh, you know make sure that the ratio is correct, but it will decompose. I think that the heat is if you want to uh, kill any pathogens and whatnot. But you know, creating a soil is not uh, that difficult. I think that um, as long as you can keep it um, not smelly and uh, you don't put anything. I would say any chemicals or uh, meat or cheese or stuff like that. We keep it very simple, just to the veggie scraps, then you're good to go. Thank you, Simona. You're welcome, it's up to you. Yeah, thanks very much, Simona. Good to meet you again. Um, so now it's my pleasure uh, at the end of the evening to introduce Thomas Dean, who is a designer and who I also met quite a bit over the years. Am I on? You're on, good go. Okay, thanks. 
Hello, everyone, and uh, thanks so much, Lee and Joachim, for the invitation to join you tonight. Thanks to all you night owls that are still with us. Um, it's just about my bedtime, but I, I'm sure I can slide this in ahead of time. Simona, I just wanted to say about your great presentation. I think I would choose that Bukashi method just for the name. I don't care whatever, whatever else it does, but it's just, I would pick it for that reason alone. So thanks to all for sharing your, your knowledge and your enthusiasm for what we're talking about. I'm, I'm going to kind of take a little bit of a left turn here just for fun. Um, just show you a couple of projects that um, as examples of what I'm going to talk about, but I wanted to focus on the community part of the community garden rather than the garden part for, for just a sec and, and maybe stretch the uh, stretch the envelope a little bit. Um, good design, in my view, um, is involves asking oneself what opportunities are there to um, to inspire um, actions or experiences that will benefit people. Um, I think that's what good design should be about. So, in in children's garden design, for example. Um, there's uh, what's known as the principle of affordance. And it, it describes how a child might approach a space. Um, and how they do that is they, they think about what can I do here? Can I run, jump, shout, play, spin, slide, swing? And they evaluate the space in terms of what the possibilities are. So, um, I think that might help any anyone who is approaching um, or is wanting to establish a community garden. It might help um, to start with the who rather than the what. In 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 my uh, humble opinion, um, in my early days, and and Amy, I I don't know if Amy's still with us. I hope so. Uh, she gave a great talk, um, but being a hard hi. Being a horticultural therapist, she would understand this. Uh, I, in my early days of learning about um, gardens as interventions for good in terms of healing, um, I looked at a whole bunch of long-term care places and seniors' residents where they had therapeutic gardens uh, that nobody was really using. And um, what it comes down to is the programming. It goes back to that children's evaluation of space in many ways, like um, people have to want to go there. And that's about programming. It's, it's not just build it and they will come. What we've got at St. George's is, is about 120 raised beds in total. Uh, the number seems to change every time I count, but give or take. Um, some of them are for the community gardeners and some are for um, CMHA's own food programs. Um, we have an edible labyrinth in the space, um, open to the entire community all day, every day. We have a food forest with fruiting trees and shrubs of many kinds, and we're continuing to expand that. We have solar food dryer for uh, tea making and herb drying and things like that. We've got pollinator habitat. Um, we are a monarch way station. So that's the garden part of the garden, of the, of the community garden. But um, here's where the magic really happens. Welcome, I hope uh, Colleen will forgive me for using her photo here, including her in the photo, but it's a great shot. So what we've got is community gardens sharing their stories, their, their trials, tribulations, successes, failures, and triumphs. Um, we've got, as Teresa so beautifully described, we've got, um, uh, CMHA clients um, engaged in helpful, meaningful employment in a safe and secure and supportive environment. Um, we've got community organizations coming in, um, gardening, hosting concerts, having art classes, uh, playing lawn darts and other games, hosting other events. And of course, we've got individual families and volunteers and um, individuals enjoying a peaceful, and restorative space. So again, just focusing on the people. 
Here's the reconciliation garden at Kelso that uh, some of you may be aware of, which is very much under construction here. What we've got here, reconciliation, I think, demands, uh, encourages the very best in us. I think it expands our capacity for communion, engagement, empathy, humility, understanding, respect. Um, it just challenges in so many wonderful ways. Um, but none of that's possible without first coming together. So this may not be a community garden in the traditional sense of the food growing, although we will have, uh, we will have uh, healing plants. And of course the sacred medicine plants will all be planted here. There will be a demonstration garden, um, but it's not typical of what we often think about as community gardens. So just wanted to focus on the people aspect of things. Great gallery, you may have uh, your eye on. Um, I don't know if Bruce Hall's still with us, but he's just up the street with his amazing community garden project too. So that Bruce will be close to, uh, to this one here on 2nd Avenue East. Um, wonderful vision of, of uh, Ann Donnertman and her husband, John, who, who appear in one of the photos there. Um, what they've put in is a number of uh, raised beds for downtown community members that would not otherwise have access to, to garden spaces. So they're sharing this uh, with them. They're sharing a space with the community. Um, it will become a sculpture garden. Um, they already hosted uh, a few concerts uh, to sort of celebrate um, art exhibits that are coming and going. So this coming spring, I think you'll begin to see um, sculptures appearing from various artists in, in the space. So this is still very much under construction. I wanted to share that with you. Again, focusing on the community. Here's Christchurch um, beginning to stretch things a little further and further. This is the free form um, labyrinth at Christchurch Anglican and Meanford. Um, and it's a place for uh, Kathy Miller, the, the, the reti now retired priest at Christchurch. It was her vision to um, create a space that would, that would better connect the community at large with the church so that people could come, they could be in a peaceful, restorative space, uh, meditate, ponder, be safe. Um, that little picture at the lower right is a little girl whose uh, guinea pig is slowly making its way around the labyrinth. So that's what's going on there. Okay, here comes a real stretch. Is this a community garden? I would argue yes. Um, you know, the uh, indigenous cultures around the world um, revere and celebrate their ancestors. They don't drop by the cemetery every Mother's Day and leave a bouquet. And uh, uh, it's a daily, it's an ongoing relationship where they, um, they're thankful, they are respectful for the the learning and the wisdom, and, the, and there's this ongoing connection with the ancestors, which is quite beautiful. Um, so this space kind of celebrates that um, opportunity, if you like. And there were um, there were challenges with the with with the space when we when we started this project uh, that we were able to turn into uh, advantages. Um, in the design and, uh, and make it a really intimate, safe, um, private space to, to sit within. So um, thanks for, for letting me stretch the envelope a little bit. And um, while just wanted you to not to not think about seed starting, compost making, soil building, raised bed making, tree planting, fundraising, food distributing, um, but just wanted to maybe focus on um, um, if you start with the with the idea of uh, of who this is about rather than what this was about. I think you will be 
um, on the wonderful path forward. So thanks so much for listening and um, 